John Chipman, uh, Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, IISS. Two quick questions. What is the NATO strategy for dealing with uh, the persistent efforts of Russia to interfere in the domestic affairs of many NATO countries and to use diverse means uh, to divide our democracies? And second, what in your view would be the conditions precedent that would permit the reconvening of the NATO-Russia Council? Sorry, and last question. What would be the conditions precedent that would permit the reconvening of the NATO-Russia Council? What would have to happen for you to feel confident that it was time to reconvene uh, that institution? Uh, first, on the NATO-Russia Council, uh, we have already convened the NATO-Russia Council. For two years, there were no meetings in the NATO-Russia Council from 2014 to 2016. Uh, and I remember when I arrived uh, at NATO uh, in October 2014, one of the tasks I was really focused on was how can we reactivate the dialogue with Russia. Because Russia is our neighbor, Russia is to stay, uh, so I strongly believe that we have to talk to Russia. But dialogue with Russia uh, has to be based on our unity and a firm and predictable approach to Russia. Therefore, the NATO approach to Russia is what we call the dual track approach. Deterrence, defense and dialogue. There is no contradiction between being strong, delivering deterrence and defense and, and talking uh, uh, to uh, Russia or having a dialogue with Russia. Actually, I believe that as long as we are strong and united, we can also talk with Russia. Dialogue is not a sign of weakness. Dialogue is actually a sign of strength. And that's very, also, very much also based on my own experience from Norway, is that even during the coldest period of the Cold War, Norway was able to talk to, work with Russia on border issues, military issues, our military, speak to the Russian military up in the high north, uh, fishery, environment, many other issues not despite NATO, but because of NATO. Because being a small nation uh, bordering Russia, we could engage in dialogue with Russia because we had the uh, strength of NATO uh, behind us. Um, so I welcome the fact that we have been able to reactivate the NATO-Russia Council. We have convened seven meetings since, uh, since 2016. We are addressing transparency, risk reduction, uh, reciprocal briefings on exercises and many other issues partly because we strive for a better relationship with Russia. But even if we don't believe that we will be able to improve the relationship with Russia, we need to manage a difficult relationship with Russia. So therefore, uh, 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 we have reactivated the NATO-Russia Council. Then um, uh, the, the first question was about what do we do, how do we address the challenges which are below our armed attack? Because armed attack will trigger Article 5. And NATO has been very successful in uh, providing credible deterrence for 70 years, preventing any armed attack against any NATO ally. And we will continue to do so. Uh, the challenge now is how do we respond to those acts of aggression which are below triggering Article 5? Well, then we need many different tools. We need to improve our cyber defenses. We are, uh, we, we are really uh, sort of stepping up when it comes to both improving the defenses of NATO networks, but also helping other allies improving the defenses of their networks. We are conducting big exercises. We are sharing best practices, technology. And UK is really a lead nation when it comes to cyber, also inside NATO. Improving intelligence, situation awareness, to understand what is going on. Uh, so we have established a new uh, intelligence division in NATO. Uh, and we will soon also improve situation awareness by our new drones, which we will uh, deploy in Sicily, but they can operate uh, all over uh, NATO territory. And, uh, and, uh, and also higher uh, um, readiness of our forces is a way to uh, respond uh, to potential hybrid threats, uh, uh, because we need to act quickly if needed. The last thing I'll mention is that we need also to counter or misinformation and propaganda. I don't believe that NATO should counter propaganda with propaganda. We are not in the propaganda business. I believe that the truth, facts, is the best way to counter propaganda. That's partly for NATO. We try to provide pro facts to nations, to journalists, to people who ask. But it's also very much a reason why we need free and independent media. 
journalists who are asking the difficult questions, checking the sources, making sure that they're not victims of attempts to uh, disinform or to, uh, to undermine our democratic institutions. Some of us have quite serious reservations about the way in which uh, the headquarters in Brussels is managed uh, domestically. And in particular, the International Board of Auditors for NATO have recently expressed uh, serious reservations in a document, NATO unclass Unclassified. And for the sake of brevity, I will only draw your attention to four of those. First, there is no common internal control network. Second, there are recurrent and persistent weaknesses in the current internal control systems in most entities. Third, difficulties in accepting and developing the identification and accounting of tangible property, plants and equipment and intangible assets. And finally, more seriously, lack of support and even opposition both internally and externally to the study of the financial consolidation and the creation of a chief financial officer. Secretary General, I asked you these questions in Warsaw just a few weeks ago, and I'm afraid you forgot to refer to the auditor's report at all, and also the select committee of the House of Lords, of which I'm a member, of which the chairman is here, uh, we, uh, in producing our report on the NATO summit, which you may or may not have seen, we put the same questions to one of your officials who said it wasn't in his field, but they let us know. That was nine weeks ago, and we're still waiting an answer. So could we have uh, your reaction to these very serious reservations from the auditors? First, I think I said that also in, uh, in uh, Warsaw when we met last time. Uh, I am strongly in favor of transparency. We need auditing. We need... Uh, we need to be transparent, uh, and we need, of course, uh, to share information about how we uh, run the headquarters with uh, all the member states. And the member states have access to all the information. Uh, so, uh, so if there's anything you, you would like to know more about how we spend money and manage our funds in NATO, you just uh, ask uh, uh, the British government, because they have access to all uh, information about how NATO is uh, governed and uh, run. Then, on top of that, uh, to make sure that we are running the headquarters in an even better way, uh, we are now in the midst of conducting a functional review of how the NATO headquarters is, is run. Uh, and one of the uh, issues we will address when heads of state and government meet in July is uh, this functional review, uh, making sure that we modernize the alliance and make sure that we are uh, governing and, and running the uh, headquarters in the best possible way. The microphone is behind you. Uh, Secretary General, two questions. First, are you nervous that when uh, President Trump comes to Brussels in a few days' time, he might uh, do the same thing to the NATO summit as he did to the G7 summit in Quebec? And my second question is, do you regard the 2% target for contributions to NATO uh, as right in the, the modern circumstances you describe, or should we be thinking in a much broader way of the definition of defense and security to keep our citizens safe on the street? Should we be looking at larger percentages than the old 2%? I'm looking forward to welcoming uh, President Trump and all the other uh, heads of state and government to Brussels uh, next month to the NATO summit. And I'm absolutely confident that uh, we will be able to demonstrate uh, transatlantic unity uh, at that summit. Because the most important sign of unity is that we are able to deliver and make decisions together. And uh, I'm confident and certain that we will be able to make those decisions in July. On deterrence and defense, increased readiness of our forces, stepping up the fight against terrorism with a new training mission in Iraq, uh, adapting the NATO command structure, uh, cyber, and many other concrete decisions that the heads of state from North America and Europe will make together. And I can hardly think about any other way to demonstrate transatlantic unity in the stronger and more convincing way that they are actually making decisions together and acting together. 
And then on top of that, we also will have a good story to tell on defense spending. Meaning that I think that we have to understand that when we made the pledge in Wales in 2014, we did that after years of decline, cut in defense spending all over Europe. And then I, I think that many, many people actually believe that this was only going to be a new commitment by leaders at an international meeting. And I've been at that kind of meetings where we pledge something, we promise something, and then we go back to our capitals and we don't implement. That has happened many times before. And it was an absolute risk that the Wales Declaration, a pledge, would just be another pledge and no action. The reality is that since we made the pledge in Wales, we actually have turned the corner and really started to invest more in defense. Then we have to remember that we, what we decided in Wales was not to meet the 2% target within a year. We decided to stop the cuts after 25 years of declining in defense budgets, to gradually increase and then move towards spending 2% for those allies who are spending less than 2% and for those allies spending more uh, to remain at minimum 2%. And that's exactly what is happening. All allies have stopped the cuts. All allies have started to increase. And uh, more allies spend 2% of GDP on uh, uh, defense. And uh, the majority of allies have put forward plans on how to reach 2% uh, uh, within uh, a decade. I'm not saying that, that we are finished. We still have a long way to go. But it's quite uh, significant, uh, the progress we have made uh, so far. We just have to continue to do that. The Wales pledge was partly about how those who are spending less than 2% should spend more. And partly it was about that those who are already above 2% should spend 2% or to, should spend minimum 2%. So of course I welcome the fact that the United Kingdom spends 2% or more than 2%. Uh, this is one of the reasons why, why the United Kingdom plays a leading role in NATO. I count on the United Kingdom to continue to play that leading role. And, uh, and uh, uh, we need uh, also those allies who are spending more than 2% to increase defense spending. Uh, partly that will just be a result of economic growth. But of course we said minimum 2%, meaning that it's absolutely within the Wales ambition to also spend more than 2%. Madeleine Moon, Member of Parliament and Member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. We have a growing partnership between NATO and the European Union. But recently a decision has been made to, by the European Commission to exclude uh, Britain's further engagement with Galileo. Do you see that having any implications in terms of the use of Galileo in NATO's important and vital use of space in the defense of the alliance? Um, let me first just uh, give some general remarks on uh, European Union and defense, and then I will, uh, I can start with the Galileo. I, I know that this is part of the negotiations, uh, and it's discussed now between UK and the European Union. Uh, therefore, I think it will be wrong if I go into the specifics of those negotiations. Um, uh, and I just hope that it's possible to find a solution which will not as I, undermine uh, the way that uh, this uh, capability also provides support for uh, European allies uh, in, their, uh, in their role uh, within uh, NATO. Um, uh, then on European defense in general, I will say that I welcome stronger EU efforts on defense, uh, but uh, as because that will help to increase defense spending, it will help to uh, develop new capabilities and will actually uh, improve burden sharing within the alliance. But it has to be uh, clear, and that has also been underlined again and again by different or many European leaders or EU, and EU leaders and leaders in European countries or EU countries that this is not uh, an alternative to NATO. This is not about competing with NATO, this uh, co is complementary to NATO. 
and, uh, and it's about strengthening the, the European pillar uh, within uh, uh, NATO. Uh, and of course, there is no way the EU, so I welcome those efforts, but not as something that can replace NATO. Uh, because uh, especially after Brexit, we have to understand that as 80% of NATO's defense expenditures will come from non-EU allies. Because the biggest uh, budget is the US, the second largest is, uh, is the United Kingdom, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course 80% uh, will then be non-EU uh, spending. Uh, this is not only about money, but also about geography. Because you have, in the north you have Norway, a uh, very important country, and then, <laughs> and then, not perhaps so big, but at least strategic, located up in the north. Uh, and then in the south you have Turkey, non-EU uh, NATO member. And in the west you will have the US, Canada, and the United Kingdom. So this is both about geography and about money, that uh, any meaningful defense of Europe is dependent on non-EU NATO allies. I am, from, I am from Lithuania, NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Vice President. I have uh, two short questions. One of them is related with hybrid warfare, which is very important, I think. And uh, um, I think we have to concentrate to think about um, uh, political systems in our countries, because Russian Kremlin main attacks or target today is a political system, a political systems in, in, in many democracies. Uh, so I don't think we have any scenario or any strategy how to uh, deal with, with such new, uh, new attacks and threats. Not very new, but threats. And second one on enlargement. Don't you think that, and what is the situation among the allies on enlargement, especially when we see uh, 10 years since Bucharest and especially Georgia is one of the candidates. And don't you think that it's too long not to say anything, at least, uh, new and not to do any new steps uh, and the people will be really disappointed and we will uh, lose important uh, ally, I think, partner for NATO. So, first about our political systems. We have to protect our democracies, our free and open societies. and. Uh, Perhaps the most important way of doing that is to participate, is to be part of political processes, is to uh, be part of uh, uh, political debates, is to, uh, as I said, uh, support free and independent media, uh, and also, of course, uh, have cyber defenses, uh, have intelligence, uh, which is able to protect or detect when any potential adversary is trying to uh, meddle in our domestic political uh, affairs. Uh, this is very much uh, about NATO, and we are doing a lot, but it's also about you know, police, uh, uh, civilian uh, authorities, and also each and, uh, each and as, uh, all of us as individual citizens uh, to be part of um, political democratic processes and uh, protect our democratic uh, institutions. Um, um, uh, so, um, so, yeah, so that's part of what we address uh, in NATO when we address what we call hybrid threats. On enlargement, NATO's door is open, and we have proven that lately with uh, uh, Montenegro. Uh, Montenegro became uh, the 29th member of uh, NATO last year, uh, and uh, we are also working with Georgia, as you mentioned, uh, NATO provides uh, practical, political support for uh, Georgia to implement reforms, to uh, modernize their defense and security institutions, uh, to uh, fight corruption, uh, to strengthen their uh, legal systems. So we are helping them to meet NATO standards so they can uh, move further uh, on their way uh, towards uh, membership. And I'm certain that at the NATO summit next month, we will find a way to recognize the progress uh, Georgia is making. Uh, and we have to also remember that NATO, there is NATO presence in Georgia today. We have 
exercises, we have a, a joint training and evaluation center, we have political cooperation, we have practical uh, work together, and Georgia is contributing to NATO missions and operations, one of the countries uh, with uh, the highest number of troops, for instance, in our uh, mission in Afghanistan. Then there is some progress uh, also uh, uh, for other countries, uh, uh, especially the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, uh, because they have now agreed on a new name, uh, the Republic of North Macedonia. And, uh, and um, uh, that agreement between uh, Skopje and Athens was ratified in the uh, parliament in Macedonia yesterday. And uh, they need also to change the constitution. To do that, they need a referendum. The plan is to, uh, to, to hold that referendum early uh, this fall. Uh, if they implement the whole agreement, then uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia will become a NATO member uh, with its new name, uh, North uh, Macedonia. Um, uh, what uh, I expect NATO leaders to do at the summit is that uh, we will then uh, invite uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia to start accession talks. And hopefully if the uh, uh, agreement is fully implemented or finalized, then we can invite them to become uh, members. Uh, and that will show that we are also making progress when it comes to open door. The last thing I will say about open door is that the, the political message is that it's only for the 29 allies and the Aspen country to decide whether NATO is enlarged or not. No other country has a say, no other country has a right to try to veto such a process. So the whole idea that a big neighbor can decide what small neighbors uh, do is, is totally violating the idea of several nations. So any kind of sphere of influence where a big neighbor can say that we don't like you to join NATO because we don't like it, uh, that's really undermining the whole idea of uh, uh, independent sovereign nations in, uh, in Europe. Not working. Okay, I'll speak now the Mathieu Boulegg, I'm a research fellow at Chatham House. Uh, Secretary General, Russia has been increasing its military capabilities and its force posture, both in the Arctic region and the High North, but also in the Black Sea. I was wondering if both regions were going to feature highly on the agenda of, this, of the summit, and if so, to which extent? Thank you. <clears throat> it, it, it's right that Russia has invested heavily in new military equipments, uh, modern capabilities. Um, they are uh, nuclear and uh, conventional and nuclear. Uh, they are exercising uh, also uh, conventional and nuclear weapons together. And, uh, uh, and uh, perhaps most importantly, they have used military force against uh, a neighbor, Ukraine, illegally annexing Crimea, destabilizing eastern Ukraine. And there are Russian troops in Georgia and in Moldova without the uh, uh, acceptance of the, of the government in Georgia and, uh, and uh, Moldova. Um, uh, that's the reason why NATO has implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense since the end of the Cold War. I mean, we have to understand that gradually we built down our defenses and what we did was not mainly collect the defense in Europe, but we did expeditionary missions outside Europe, first in the Balkans, or not outside Europe, but at least outside NATO territory, first in the Balkans, helping to end uh, two wars there, and then Afghanistan, fighting piracy, fighting terrorism. Then after 2014, NATO had to in a way, go back home and to focus on collective defense deterrence in, in Europe. And I'm actually quite impressed how much we have been able to do just over a few years uh, with both more troops in the eastern part of the alliance, with the battle groups, but also increased presence in the Black Sea region, uh, with higher redness, tripling the size of the NATO response force, more defense spending, and we will make new decisions at the summit now to further increase the redness of our forces and, uh, and uh, developing new capabilities. Um, having said that, for NATO, it's always a challenge to find the right balance between responding, being strong, without increasing tensions unnecessarily, and make sure that we are responding in a defensive and proportionate way. 
Therefore, for instance, the focus now is not mainly on deploying more forces in the eastern part of the lines, but is to increase our ability to reinforce. That's about military mobility, high redness, and all that. And uh, that is also the case in the high north. We are doing more in the high north. We have also more naval capabilities. We, we see that, for instance, the U.S. is now also uh, 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 training more in Norway uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, several allies, including the United Kingdom, uh, Denmark, Norway, are investing in new uh, advanced capabilities, like, for instance, F-35 uh, fighter jets, uh, uh, new battleships, and so on, which are relevant for the high north. But we used to say that uh, we, are, we want, uh, in the high north, we want to see low tensions. And I think we should still strive for, to keep tensions down. And that's also one of the reasons I welcome the fact that we not only have the NATO-Russia Council, but we also have the Arctic Council, we have the Barents Cooperation, which are frameworks to try to uh, create uh, platforms for dialogue with Russia to try to avoid to increase tensions too much. We have increased also our presence in the Black Sea region, uh, both in Romania, Bulgaria, uh, but also uh, at sea and, um, and in the air. Uh, British jets have actually done some air policing down there. Uh, so, uh, so it just shows that NATO has increased their presence uh, or our presence in, uh, in also the Black Sea region. Sir, good morning. My name is Mukim Abdurahim Zay. I am from Afghanistan and uh, currently a student at the Royal College of Defense Studies here in London. Uh, can you kindly comment on recently ceasefire initiative in Afghanistan? And although the ceasefire uh, partially ended, but what can NATO do in order to support peace and, and uh, negotiation dialogue in this, countries, in this country after 17 years of war? Thank you. There are many problems in Afghanistan, and it's, uh, and it's uh, uh, extremely important to be aware of that there is no easy way out of those problems. Uh, we see violence, we see uh, Taliban, we see uh, ISIS, uh, we see uh, uh, problems with the implementing necessary reforms of the Afghan government, we see corruption, there are many problems. Having said that, I think we have to also recognize that there has been some progress. Partly the fact that NATO has been able to end our combat mission and hand over the responsibility for security in Afghanistan to, to the Afghans themselves. That's a great achievement. Uh, because when Taliban attacked before, it was UK soldiers or Danish soldiers or Norwegian soldiers that had to go out and respond. Now, when there's a terrorist attack in Afghanistan, it's the Afghan soldiers themselves who go out and repel or respond. So just the fact that we have been able to train and build an Afghan forces into forces which are able to take uh, responsibility for security in their own country is progress. Uh, and NATO has totally transformed our presence in Afghanistan from a big combat operation to now, with more than 100,000 troops, to now 16,000 troops conducting training, assisting, and advising. And I welcome that. that, that. And the Afghans are professional, uh, committed, and uh, they, they are able to fight back when we see uh, attacks from the Taliban. And let me add that I think this concept, in the long run, is much more viable than NATO engaging or uh, uh, in big combat operations or being part of big combat operations because in the long run the best weapon we have against terrorism is not to deploy our own troops in combat operations which we have to do sometimes but the best weapon we have is to train local forces enabling them to fight terrorism themselves and that's exactly what we have done in Afghanistan. The other encouraging thing we have seen is the peace initiative uh, from President Ghani and the fact that for the first time we have seen at least a ceasefire uh, that uh, at least to some extent worked. Uh, the government uh, announced the ceasefire and then Taliban at least for some days also agreed the ceasefire. Again, we have a long way to go, but it is encouraging that there is at least some real attempts to create a framework for a, 
reconciliation process uh, uh, peace and that we have seen the first ceasefire ever in the conflict in Afghanistan. So we have to build on that. Now, the last thing I will say about this is that the way to achieve that is not to leave Afghanistan. The way to achieve that is to stay in Afghanistan. Because Taliban has to understand that they will never win on the battlefield. So as long as we convey and show by staying that they will not win on the battlefield, we will train, assist, and advise, and fund the Afghan forces, then they will uh, uh, at some stage understand that they will achieve more around the negotiating table than uh, at the battlefield or on the battlefield. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Beale, BBC. Um, I'd just like to ask you about defence spending first. And you say NATO has a good story to tell, but that clearly isn't the view of President Trump, who's still highly critical of NATO defence spending. I just wonder in your speech whether you've been papering over cracks in the alliance and that the relationship, the rift within the alliance is actually uh, greater than it's ever been. The second question is about, um, you've mentioned uh, Crimea, Skripal, um, there is talk, there are reports that President Trump will try and meet President Putin uh, around the time of the NATO summit. What kind of message do you think that's going to send? Thank you. So my message is that there are real disagreements between NATO allies on serious issues. On trade, on environment, on the Iran nuclear deal and many other issues. And I take that seriously. But my message is also that we have seen that we have been able to overcome that kind of differences before. Second, that it is in our interest to stand together. And thirdly, that when it comes to NATO, to security and defense, the transatlantic bond is not weakening, it's actually been strengthened. So we speak about the transatlantic bond as, it's, uh, as it is one bond. But the, the, the reality is that there are many ties. And yes, there have been, we have seen some weakening of some of them on trade and other issues. But when, when it comes to defense and security, there is no doubt that actually we see closer transatlantic cooperation now than just a couple of years ago. More US troops in, in, in Europe after years of decline. More U.S. spending for exercises, troops, pre-positioned equipment in Europe now than a few years ago. So when President Trump and the United States states that they are in favor of NATO, they believe in the transatlantic bond, that's not only something they say, they do it. It's not only words, but also in deeds. And I'm absolutely certain that at the summit we'll make new decisions on how the United States, Canada, and Europe can do more together, both in Europe, higher readiness, 30 new battalions, 30 new battleships, 30 uh, air squadrons on high readiness, uh, on stepping up our efforts to fight terrorism, on uh, working together in cyber, creating a framework so UK and other nations can provide, we call them sovereign cyber effects. Um, that's concrete actions. And action speaks louder than words. So we are delivering transatlantic cooperation, transatlantic unity, transatlantic uh, partnership. Not only talking, but doing something. So that's what we have done, and that is what we're going to do when we meet in, in, in July. I'm not saying that that's solving all the problems. I'm not saying that since we are delivering on defense, we have solved the trade issues. I'm only saying that the disagreement on trade, environment, Iran, which are serious issues, they have not undermined our ability to stand together when it comes to defense and security. And, and my main reason, also, I will of course welcome very much if we're able to solve the trade issues. But as long as they remain unsolved, my main responsibility is to make sure that we continue to deliver on defense and security. Um, then, I cannot promise you exactly what, I say, what will be stated and, and what, I, what kind of rhetoric we will hear at the summit. Um, 
what I can say is that I really believe that we will make decisions. And in the long run, that's the best way to demonstrate unity, what we do. I expect the president to be very strong on defense spending. I met him uh, in May in the White House. President Trump was very clear that he's committed to NATO, to Article 5. And I actually thanked him for his leadership on defense spending because it has had an impact. Uh, but I think it's absolutely possible to ask the Europeans to do more, but at the same time recognize the progress. And uh, I have also heard uh, President Trump welcoming the fact that European allies are spending more. He actually recently spoke about the money is pouring in. So it is possible to say, we have done a lot, but a lot remains. And uh, he, said he speaks in a kind of direct language, and I expect to, that to be the case also when it comes to Europe in July. Oh. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. To meet President Putin is not in any way contradicting NATO policies. Because NATO is in favor of dialogue with Russia. And if you want dialogue, you have to speak to the political leaders. So, uh, so uh, several NATO leaders have met President Putin. Uh, we, as NATO, we meet uh, with uh, Russia in the NATO-Russia Council. I met with uh, Secretary uh, uh, Lavrov, Foreign Minister Lavrov, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, the whole message of NATO is that we don't want, to, we don't want a new Cold War, we don't want a new arms race. We don't want to isolate Russia. We want to talk to Russia. Russia stay to stay. And, uh, and, and then again, as I said, it's partly this is about striving for a better relationship with Russia, which is in our interest. But even if we don't believe we are able to get a better relationship with Russia in the foreseeable future, we need to talk to them, to manage a difficult relationship. To avoid incidents and accidents, we have more military presence, more exercises, high tensions, so we have to avoid dangerous situations like the downing of the Russian plane over Turkey. And if they haven't ha happen, make sure that, don't, that they don't spiral out of control. So one of the issues we have addressed in the NATO-Russia Council is, for instance, air safety in the Baltic uh, Sea region. Small but important step towards uh, avoiding uh, incidents and accidents. So, to talk to the Russians is uh, in line with NATO policies. Gentlemen in the first row. <clears throat> Thank you. Carl Dinan from ITV News. Moderate increases in defence spending are unlikely to be enough to allow the UK to maintain its current level of capability. How would you feel about this country being able to do a little bit less? I welcome UK leadership in NATO. And uh, one of the reasons why the UK has played a leading role and is playing a leading role in NATO is, of course, that you have so many uh, high-end capabilities. You have full-spectrum uh, defense forces, uh, conventional cyber nuclear. Uh, and you are spending more than 2% uh, on uh, defense. I strongly, so I, I, and I expect UK to continue uh, uh, and to maintain that role. And to maintain that role, of course, you need to spend and invest uh, in defense, uh, in new capabilities, both cyber, but also uh, modernizing your nuclear forces and on the uh, conventional forces. And as we said in Wales, in the declaration we actually agreed here in the United Kingdom in 2014, we agreed that those countries which are spending more than 2% should uh, uh, continue to spend minimum 2% uh, of GDP on defense. So uh, I urge uh, the United Kingdom to, continue to maintain its leading role, and, uh, and, and that's good for UK, it's good for NATO, and uh, uh, we need all the capabilities that the uh, UK uh, provides to the Alliance. Skorony de Woiber, Ministry of Defence. Um, what would you like to see the European Union do specifically to help enable SACUR's AOR? 
to build beautiful bridges and roads and uh, airports and uh, harbors so we can move our uh, equipment uh, even faster than we do today. Meaning that one of the flagships in the NATO-EU cooperation is when, uh, military mobility. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, this is a responsibility for each and every member state of NATO, regardless of whether they are EU member or uh, non-EU member. But the European Union uh, can provide funding uh, and help with investments in infrastructure and also address some uh, legal hurdles to be able to move equipment, uh, ammunition, and so on fast throughout uh, Europe. But we cannot make that totally dependent on the European Union because we have to be able to move also equipment through non-EU uh, European uh, allies. Uh, so, uh, but we are working with the European Union. I circulate, I sent a letter to uh, the EU presidents, uh, President Tusk and President Juncker, recently, uh, where I listed uh, actually NATO uh, requirements for moving uh, our equipment. Uh, you know, to move a main battle tank on a, a thing, flat back, yeah. uh, or a truck, then that, that, that weighs uh, something like 120 tons. So it's a really heavy thing. So you need infrastructure which can carry that. Um, and we work, yeah, so we work together with them. They know about our requirements and we, and we, we hope that we can make real progress. The last thing I say about that is that I signed uh, a joint declaration with President Juncker and President Tusk in Warsaw in connection with our uh, summit there in 2016. Uh, we are planning to sign a new joint declaration, President Juncker, President Tusk and I, uh, in Brussels in connection with the summit there. Uh, so outlining the vision for how we can further strengthen the cooperation between NATO and the European Union. I think we have time for two more short questions. I see James Defence. Hey, um, Mark Hazlett, James Defence Weekly. Um, with the increased Russian militarization of the Arctic, um, is it time for NATO to take a more active role instead of leaving it to the Arctic Council? I think we... <laughs> We have never left the collective defense of the Arctic to the Arctic Council. I've been in many meetings in the Arctic Council. It's not as I say, the strongest defense uh, uh, union I've seen. Uh, many nice people there and many good meetings, but it's not uh, defense. Uh, but the Arctic Council is important because it is a platform for bringing people together and address environmental issues, search and, search and rescue. And, and one of the things I, I believe in is that we need, for instance, to work together with, with Russia also on search and rescue, which we do actually up in the Arctic. Um, and uh, some NATO allies are doing that, and, uh, and that's kind of, yeah, cooperation which benefits both Russia, Norway, and other NATO allies. Um, uh, and again, NATO <coughs> have invested in capabilities which are uh, important for the high north and the Arctic. Uh, UK, Denmark, other uh, uh, NATO allies, Norway, are, uh, have or are now investing in new naval capabilities. I uh, know that N Norway bought some new frigates uh, not so many years ago, uh, and we, uh, Norway also decided to buy 52 F-35s, uh, new maritime patrol aircrafts. All of that is relevant for the uh, Arctic. So we are increasing our presence and our capabilities in the Arctic, also Norway, UK, and other NATO allies. We are establishing the new uh, command for the Atlantic, which will be extremely important for planning, exercises, all that, linking North America and Europe together, which is also about the, the Arctic. Uh, uh, UK is investing in new submarines. So, so, so we are doing a lot, but at the same time, we should try to keep tensions down uh, in the high north. Thank you. Uh, Flight Lyle from the Royal Air Force. Uh, Secretary General, uh, two very quick questions for you. First is that uh, some commentators have argued that intervention in Syria uh, in the recent conflict sooner might have prevented some of the atrocities that have happened there. I wanted to know your thoughts on that and if that were the case, whether NATO have learned their lesson uh, in intervening in the future. And then secondly, you've spoken about NATO being uh, open door and, and the strength of it in the alliance. I wondered if you could just share some thoughts about Turkey 
and some of their acts, certainly if you look at the way their government is going um, and the sort of the standards that we looked up hold in the West versus the direction that they're traveling in. Thank you. NATO is part of the global coalition to defeat ISIS and uh, some NATO allies are also present on the ground uh, uh, in Syria to defeat ISIS. Uh, but we are not uh, part of any, we're not part of, as I say, uh, the conflict in Syria, uh, uh, except for uh, the uh, fight against uh, Daesh or ISIS. And I think that in Syria, what we need there uh, is uh, uh, strong support to all efforts to try to find a peaceful negotiated uh, solution. And there has been no uh, ask, no call for a NATO uh, military presence in Syria, except for uh, our support to the global coalition in the fight against uh, Daesh. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that, uh, I think that uh, uh, of course, NATO has to be ready uh, to deploy forces to uh, engage in big combat operations also in the future. But I think also that one of the lessons we have learned from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Libya, is that military intervention is not always solving all problems. So uh, if we're able to find negotiated, peaceful uh, solutions, that's always better. And also the idea of training local forces, not necessarily in Syria, but as a general concept, as we do in Af Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, is in the long run more uh, viable to enable them to stabilize their own country. We work also with Tunisia, Jordan, and other countries in the region to help them stabilize the region. Uh, then Turkey. Turkey is a key ally uh, for several reasons, uh, partly because of its geographic location, bordering Iraq and Syria. The fight against Daesh, ISIL, has been very much dependent on uh, Turkey providing infrastructure bases, uh, the work we have done together to close the borders. Uh, and, uh, and we have to also remember that uh, no other NATO ally has suffered more terrorist attacks than Turkey and they suffered a violent uh, uh, failed uh, coup uh, or uh, coup attempt in July 2016. Uh, so I think uh, it is important to make sure that we continue to work with Turkey. Um, uh, NATO is based on some core values, democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and these values are important for the alliance. I have stressed the importance of these values uh, in many of my meetings in different NATO capitals, including in Ankara. Uh, but the important thing is that we make sure that we work, continue to work together with Turkey, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's exactly what we do. Also, when it comes to, for instance, the situation in northern Syria, uh, where I welcome the direct dialogue between uh, Turkey and uh, the United States, on how to deal with the situation around Manbij uh, and, uh, and to find a roadmap or a way to, to work together in addressing the extremely difficult and complex challenges we see there. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for. Thank you.